every generation needs a revolution, Jimmy. The American dream is just that. Just a dream. War is a continuation of politics. Only by other means. Politics is a continuation of economics by other means. This is our bank. This is our war. And this is our plan of attack. Banks have become an essential threat to our democracy. So consider this justice. Thank you for listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, the number one listener-supported radio station on the Internet. Please help support this station so this battle can continue forward. Revolution Radio! The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. It's a theory advanced that the universe is a living, giant being, and that we, as human beings, made in its image, are miniature universes in ourselves, containing millions of corpuscles. The components of each corpuscle imagine themselves to be in a complete world of their own. Please join T.J. Morris as she brings topics on cosmology, metaphysics, conspiracy theories, science, theology, ufology, and psychic awakening. Prepare to have your conscious go cosmic. There we go. Let me see if I can get this straight now. We have a little technical difficulties here. If we can get Janet now. There we go, Janet. You are alive now. Okay. I'll try, I'll try and get okay. TJ here in just a second. And your guest. Okay. And Ira is our guest. Okay, I'll start talking about our guest. Aloha and welcome to the Cosmos Connection with your host, Janet Care Lesson and Teresa J. Morris. Today, our special guest is Ira S. Pastor. And let me tell you a little bit about Ira. He is the Chief Executive Officer at BioCork, Inc., and he's had over 30 years of experience across multiple sectors of the pharmaceutical industry, including pharmaceutical commercialization, biotech drug development, managed care distribution, OTC, and retail. And there you are, TJ. I was saying a little bit about Ira Pastor while we were waiting for you. And let me just say this. We are live and on the air. We are live and on the air. Okay. And uh, go ahead. You talk. I I don't have to talk. You talk. (laughs) Well, you're talking about our pastor, and I just got picked up. So I don't know where you're at in leading, leading that he is the president and CEO of Court. And he talks a lot about uh, what we should do in the future. Do you have his bio pulled up? Because I don't. I do, I do. So okay, why well, don't you read his bio? Yeah, so I already did part of it. So he is a, um, he works with regenerative medicine side of the biotechnology, yeah, can't talk to me, biotechnology industry. <laughs> and for the last few years, he's been involved in the dynamics of central nervous system regeneration, studying both human and non-human species. And... He says we find audience, audiences quite interested in the themes and deeper questions as to the as of yet unexplainable topics related to the human mind, consciousness, memories that have emerged over the years, but the, for the most part have been ignored or conveniently forgotten. So some of his articles on this extensive page I put up for him on AquarianRadio.com. He has links to articles that they've written, 25, or he's written, 25 strategies 
for living longer. And uh, let's see, he was on a podca- podcast, the longevity from the longevity and biohacking show. And he's talking about synthetic biology, diabetes, and induced pancreatic, pancreatic regeneration repair. So basically, he's talking about um, physical and more immortality or extreme longevity. And uh, he's talking about where the soul may reside following the death of the human brain. And he's exploring the electromagnetic fingerprint of our mind and consciousness. So there's a number of questions there we could ask him. About 15, okay. 15. On the okay. page. I'm not going to say now. Just save it for when we bring him on. All right. Well, we appreciate uh, this honored guest. We had him on Tuesday with Dan and I, and I was very impressed with his, uh, I guess we would say, interest in humanity. And uh, he's been involved with the pharmaceutical ideas of this reality since he was a child. Now, Ira, can you hear me? I apologize for being a little strangely weird connected. Uh, Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Oh, great, great. Okay, what year were you born? Yeah, were you born in Philadelphia? And if so, what year? I was born in Philadelphia, October 29th, 1968, at 1 in the afternoon. Oh, bless your heart. You're just a baby. You're my children's age. Okay, I'm a very old lady. (laughs) Wonderful. (laughs) Now, you you worked around your dad's... uh, Is this my understanding that your parents were in pharmaceuticals or in a... Tell us a little about your younger history as a child and what got you into helping humanity. Uh, Sure. So, yeah, I mean, I grew up um, in a family here in the Philadelphia area in the 1960s, and uh, my father was a a pharmacist, and he had a small uh, chain of independent uh, drugstores in and around the Philadelphia area. Uh, so I was always, uh, from a young age, hanging out with him. Um, you know, I, I was <laughs> vacuuming the floor and, and, and cleaning the shelves and things like that. But I was always around uh, medicine and bottles of drugs and things like that in his stores. And so it was sort of something I was immersed in from a, a very young age. So it was sort of preordained that I would follow in his footsteps and... Um, and become a pharmacist, which actually I did uh, by undergraduate training. I, I did go to pharmacy school. Um, the, uh, but you know, that was sort of you know one side of um, my early education in this area. The the other thing I point out um, is that I'm a, a self admitted uh, comic book and uh, science fiction. <laughs> movie junkie uh, and have been so ever since a young age and so ah um, you didn't tell us that last time yeah, that I, makes I, you even more interesting yeah, yeah and, and, and <laughs> the interesting more interesting thing about it i think that side of things actually swayed me a little more uh into what i'm doing now because you know whether um it was spider-man uh spinning a web or uh, the folks in the movie The Abyss, you know, going down to the bottom of the ocean and breathing liquid, uh, oxygen, or whether it was any of the, uh, you know, alien movies um, where they went into suspended animation to uh, take the long journeys out into the cosmos. Um, At the end of the day, I was always thrilled by the possibilities uh, that uh, would come from technology and, and biotechnology or the life sciences, which is sort of my area. And, you know, here we are, just as a side note, in 2017, and uh, there are multiple labs um, around the world that are now learning how to spin spider silk to create super strong uh, fabrics for, for various applications. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Which is the phone that's supposed to be dead. <laughs> okay, can you mute it? You can mute. Yeah, hold on. I'll mute. Okay, that helps. Okay, sorry about that. Back to Spider-Man and today's time with science. So, 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 so who's spinning what? <laughs> yeah, so we're spinning spider webs now. Uh, we are actually here in Philadelphia at Temple University. They are perfecting uh, liquid oxygen breathing for premature infants. I mean, we 
we do breathe liquid for nine months. Uh, and um, when you there is a premature baby, uh, it's very difficult for them to breathe oxygen out of the air. And they're creating uh, liquid breathing systems for these premature infants at Temple University. Uh, and then there's this whole area of uh, so-called cryptobiosis research, uh, teaching uh, the body how to sleep for long periods of time, like uh, you know, hibernating squirrels and bears and things like that. So uh, the, the science fiction of my childhood, comic books and uh, science fiction movies, is slowly but surely coming to fruition. So, you know, uh, combined what those interests were with the fact that I was sort of immersed in the life sciences or the pharmaco therapeutic side of the life sciences um sort of molded my interests into doing something bigger than uh you know just selling another uh, uh anti-inflammatory drug for for pain or uh or another cholesterol lowering drug so um, did you raise a family because you had to you were in sales for a long time but you had to make money and and sales is usually the best way to do it right you went into sales before you went into heavy biocork reanimation and uh, reanima and all those higher levels of of, uh, i don't know what is that research are you a researcher now well i mean i'm a i run the company, I'm the CEO, I'm a business development guy at heart, uh, but I do know enough about R&D, having spent several years there in, in previous lives. Um, so, yeah, oh, no, definitely. I, I have a, a, a lovely wife of 20 years, um, three children, uh, 11, 13, and 15, um, with a 15-year-old who I just got into comic books. So uh, <laughs> um, he's following my footsteps there. Um, yeah, no, I, I did go through retail. Uh, I went through sales and marketing and all that fun stuff. Uh, so that was the, the early path into this more... Uh, resource and money intensive side of the business uh, where you're, yes, you're spending a lot of time and money on R&D and trying to uh, come up with the next big thing. And in a industry that's known for, you know, success rates of one in 40,000, um, it's, it's not like creating another app. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a lot longer time frame and it takes a lot more money. Uh, but that's where I find my passion now uh, in changing the world uh, via the life sciences. Well, give us an idea of what your life is like. What's a typical day? Do you, because of your age, your mid middle uh, range, uh, we discussed 70 to 80 Tuesday, and we were also discussed super centenarians, and we'd like to do a little bit of that again because it's interesting. But you model what is your life like? Give us an idea of who we're living with on this planet. Are you an average American? And, uh, you know, are you following uh, the world, uh, geopolitics, uh, Trump, uh, all that? And, and how do you live and how do you get your money now? <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm a you know a pretty average uh, American. Um, as I said, I spend most of my time with my wife and my three children, and raising them and teaching them to be uh, more than I was at the <laughs> at the younger at a younger age. Um, I um, I'm active in their their life uh, in terms of schooling and extracurricular activities and things of this nature. Uh, I, um, I usually, my sleep patterns have been altered substantially since I, uh, we had children. So, you know, four o'clock in the morning, I'm usually wide awake and I spend a couple hours while the house is quiet, uh, catching up on the, uh, on emails and uh, the various uh, news flow from around the world. Um, uh, and for the most part, uh, you know, if, if I'm, from a health and wellness perspective, I, I try to stay away from as much of the, uh, the mainstream media and the, the sort of the daily flow of news as possible because, uh, you know, it's been shown that, you know, too much of that can lead to severe <laughs> depression and anxiety and so forth. Um, and ultimately, you know, I, I look at the system from a perspective of, look, there's a lot of bad stuff happening, uh, a lot of bad things going on. But um, at least from sort of the corner of the universe I come from, we think that um, there are tremendous possibilities uh, before us. 
and in making this whole new planet, cosmos, uh, a much better place, <laughs> or a, a much more enjoyable place than it is, um, or, or like, at least the media uh, portrays nowadays, and what's going on around us, whether it's North Korea, or terrorism, or hurricanes, or what have you. Um, I think there's solutions out there that uh, that technology has for us uh and and not just solutions for health and agriculture and energy but uh as you said solutions for maybe some of the bigger questions um that will elevate us all in, in terms of our minds and our spirits and our um just purpose in this cosmos so um but long story short i'm pretty an average guy uh Philly boy, born and raised, and here I am uh, trying to change the world <laughs> from the hip city of brotherly love. Well, that's good. Uh, what did you expect uh, today for Cosmos Connection? You sharing who you are with the world, and this will be recorded. You're recording live, but you know people will hear you all over and hear you, and then they will come back and hear you maybe years from now. And uh, you know, I've got six years of recordings on my Blog Talk Radio archives and go on iTunes and Stitcher. And we'll take these. Gene is famous for that. Taking them off of here and putting them on Spreaker and putting them on YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. What would you like people to remember? What's your legacy thus far and what you would like to leave before you pass? The next dimension. <laughs> uh, that uh, I was a person that wanted to make this world uh, during my uh biophysical time here, uh, a better place, uh, that I was a strong believer in the connections of the future and the past and the present, uh, and that, as you just mentioned about, you know, the fact that my voice will be uh, here uh, in a medium uh, throughout time um, and resonates with people in the future, um, I believe that you know, some of the insights that uh, are coming to fruition or may have been have come to fruition in the past or what will be discovered shortly um, is that that knowledge and information is uh, infinite. It's forever. Um, and I like to use the word resonate a lot because I do believe that uh, as we are learning everything that goes on, um, at least from the life science side of things, it is all about resonating. Uh, it's all about information flow. Um, and uh, I believe that that, uh, beyond the recording and beyond the physical medium, uh, will exist uh, for an infinite amount of time uh, throughout space-time. Um, that being said, I, I, I think, as you said, and, and people will find that although I am sort of... Uh, I come from a uh, kind of materialistic, uh, monolithic type industry um, that my perspective on the bigger picture is exactly that. It's uh, a little bigger um, in that the things we do in the lab uh, or what we cultivate in the field and so forth, um, they are not independent of the rest of the system. Uh, and the system is highly integrated and connected. And until we understand that, uh, and we, at least on the healthcare side as an example, start creating interventions that take all of that into account, uh, we're going to miss the big picture on how to truly impact the human situation. Um, but ultimately, uh, yeah, I would like people to look back and say, hey, uh, like the Wright brothers, like Edison or whatever, here was a guy that wanted to change things and, you know, was fine with taking the risks of tinkering uh, and doing things a slightly different way uh, than have been done for the last hundred years. All right. Well, with regards to uh, biology, evolutionary process, genomes, uh, biocybernetics, uh, how do you feel about the singularity? And I'm sure you're familiar with many names in that. And you also mentioned, uh, was it you that mentioned Ian Stevenson in Virginia or someone else? that word. So how, I guess just anything that comes to mind about what I just said. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, 
when, when you're in this space, um, there's the obvious connections. And I, I'm an advisor, for instance, to the uh, the transhumanist uh, political party in terms of uh, regeneration um, sciences and technology. Um, and I do understand the uh, the picture, sort of the social movement and uh, the concepts behind transhumanism. Um, when it comes to, I guess, the next phases of that dynamic, when you mentioned the singularity and Ray Kurzweil type of mind uploading and, um, you know, becoming one with uh, the system, uh, the matrix or what, yeah, however you want to define it. Um, I don't, you know, I, I can't speak too well much about that. What I can speak to is the fact that, um, in my opinion, as much as there is to be learned about history, uh, I'm sorry, about uh, the future and those types of technologies, uh, I personally find it much more uh, interesting and satisfying to study the past. Uh, I'm a big proponent of the history, and not just of the uh, biomedical history, but just in studying our evolutionary history and nature. Uh, and when you think of sort of how little of reality uh, the human mind can currently perceive, yet we have our friends in the natural world that uh, can see uh, in the ultraviolet spectrum and can see in infrared and can uh, magnetonavigate uh, and can echolocate and a vast array of other capabilities, I'll call them superhero type capabilities, uh, that are possessed uh, by non-human organisms, um, I, I think there's much more, well, personally, while I, I know a lot of people in the sort of the transhumanist world that are all about <laughs> becoming part of, the, of, of a computer in the future, I think that there's a, let's say, nature's computer out there that many species already tap into. Um, and... This, in my opinion, is equally, if not more, exciting uh, as part, you know, being a uh, a biologic entity um, that uh, I think is much more worthy and interesting to devote time to. Uh, I much rather <laughs> I I've never been one that's been in too interested in being a uh, a cyborg. Let's say <laughs> I kind of like my my biological state. Um, but whatever. I mean, I guess there's different opinions on that uh, from different types of people. But um, I think we, get, we, we, we have a lot of fascinating discoveries to make um, in this world. Uh, while I do understand the interest in, you know, Kurzweil type folks putting themselves into the, <laughs> the system, I'm, I'm not there yet personally. Well, you mentioned the U.S. Yeah, go ahead, Jane, and then I want to talk about this transhumanist bill of rights. Right. But uh, you can pull them up too. Go ahead. You next, well, Jane. I, 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 I've been wondering if you've ever researched. My husband and I are Anunnaki uh, research, researchers. My husband is a anthropologist trained at UCLA, and so we've got into the ancient anthropology and the. Uh, archaeology and all the, the findings that we're discovering now around the world because we have the, the sonar capabilities from satellite to find these things that were previously hidden from us. And one of the things that's been uh, found and deciphered and recovered are the translations of the ancient languages like the Akkadian and Sumerian. And the mm -hmm. Sumerians have a story of the geneticists um, who were Anunnaki and they were Enki, Nima, and Thoth. And what they did before they created, or somewhere in the process of creating humanity, is they played with putting genes together. So they, you know, they created minotaurs and centaurs and, uh, you know, all kinds of different beings. And uh, because it was so many hundreds of thousands of years ago, we consider it myth. But let's just, you know, what we do is we take it as, let's see what's really going on here. And the stories correlate with the findings. 
So there's a greater picture emerging. So one of the things that they did as geneticists is that they created Homo sapiens sapiens by uh, hybridizing human human beings um, with the uh, Anunnaki genome. So they the existing human being or um, humanoid, I should say, uh, was probably Homo erectus, and so they or you know Sasquatch, uh, the ancients uh, now. It was a modern sad cross. Anyway, I'm not doing this very well. But what I'm saying is, <laughs> um, we're we're a we're a hybrid species, and one of the things they did is they turned off our longevity genes. The Anunnaki were at least 450,000 years old, and so if we could just wrap our heads around that this is what actually existed in the past, take it as truth, and start researching it based on the probability that can be recreated and that they switched off 256 genes so that we wouldn't have our superpowers. We were no longer telepathic or telekinetic and um, start looking at it from that perspective. And it, it's, this isn't just me and my husband, this is uh, volumes, just Google Anunnaki and, and uh, how humanity was created and there's YouTubes and it's a whole gigantic field and it seems to be uh, supported, at least in a court of law, it would be, you know, held up. But, you know, the, the scientific community, because it doesn't fit into their box, tends to throw it out. But I'm wondering, have you ever thought about it, researched it, you know, have any understanding of it, and are willing to look at it? Because there could be the keys to, you know, solving every... Uh, they, they weren't sick. They didn't get sick like we did. They were immune to it, so... Yeah, anyway, um, just to lay that out there. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, just as a uh, aside, I mean, I have, well, I, I, I can't say I'm as well-versed as, as you. I have read uh, some of Stitchin's books in the past, so I'm somewhat familiar with the, the general idea. And yes, I find, um, I find answers uh, to, what's the answers? I find parallels and clues uh, specifically in the lesser known uh, area of so-called regulatory genomics. So let, me, I'll, let me connect to that for a moment. Um, mm -hmm. As most of the audience is aware, you know, the last 20 years or so have been a lot about uh, the human genome as it stands today. Um, and the discovery about 20 years ago that um, the, the human genome consists of about 25,000 protein coding genes uh, responsible for uh, basically who we are. It, it, I say not responsible for because genes don't do anything by themselves. They're just information. But basically 25,000 protein coding genes that control the information that ultimately from some higher biokinetics structure are fed into and create us as we sit here today. Um, that was what the public heard about, and that's true. What the public didn't hear as much about is that dogs and chimps and cats and snakes and frogs and fish and worms and plants they pretty much all have the same genes. <laughs> there was nothing special about us. Um, what was special was the structure around the genes uh, and how they were turned on and off. Um, I don't want to talk about that because, you know, when they, came, you know, they found out that we were, you know, 92% puffer fish and that we were 94% the tree frog and all that, uh, we didn't seem as special. <laughs> but so ultimately, yes, I, I, I understand. Well, I, I, I'm not as well versed about what they were doing 450,000 years ago. I can indeed see the um, information and the message in the genome. Um, and where and how uh, our superpowers, as I will call them, um, over time uh, were slowly turned off. Uh, and whether those superpowers, as I, you know, I like to talk about them, are the ability to regenerate and replace lost or damaged organs, uh, or whether they are the ability to stave off disease of any type, or whether they are uh, the ability to live uh, for 
multi hundreds of years or to age backwards or to raise from the dead, um, the potential is there in the genome. It's there. Uh, we know it's there because uh, our relatives uh, that were hanging around have these abilities. Uh, and there is not much difference in the genes as much as there is in the hierarchical structure of the genome. Uh, so yes, um, I think, um, and I've been a strong proponent of this, that aside from you know the obvious human health connections uh, to bio life science research, it is a portal <laughs> in many ways into accessing a wide range of superhuman capabilities that we have just brushed off. And I think we too often, as you say, think about as myth, um, which, no, <laughs> they're not. They're right in front of us. Uh, we just, unfortunately, too often forget about nature uh, and the billions of years of history, information that is sitting in front of us. And, and sometimes just our fear of looking at it obscures us to the uh, the beauty and the potential. Thank you, Ira. TJ. Yes. Okay, Ira. Uh, regarding singularity, are transhumanist uh, ways, maybe uh, biological or otherwise, uh, what is the otherwise if we're not biological, but yet we know that we're going into space and we've been in space and certain uh, Human sentient intelligent beings are much more aware of this than those that have no need to know whether they're all nations and governments But let's say for instance you are aware that there's something out there that may not be biological, but it, it records information uh, And we're, we're coming to an awareness of science and technology with spirit that I'm working with and on and far and I'm always recruiting but it's been a long process in this lifetime. So I'm looking to adapt and to adopt to a way of speaking to people such as yourself. Uh, what would you call something that is sentient life and biological and also of a higher sentient entity in a way that we may think transdimensional? Sort of a Dream Roddenberry question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so... If, if you divide, so okay, if you if you put aside okay, biologic transhumanism, and then uh, I'll say I'll, I'll call it silicon uh, transhumanism on the the other um, end of things, the cyborg uh, computer stuff, which I really can't speak to until it, it, I can speak to it intelligently, but it's not my <laughs> it's not my core. Well, let um, me help you out here. I'm a cyborg. Does that help cyborg. you any? And I'm looking for you. You're a cool cyborg. Uh, well, thank uh, you. <laughs> um, I'd like to think so. <laughs> so, so here is the here is what else, in my opinion, is out there. Um, at our once, let me come back to bio first, and then I'll I'll go back out there. Um, even though we are a biologic entity right now, uh, as we sit here talking, at our core. Um, all the biology is doing is serving as a uh, a base for electrical, electromagnetic uh, information flow. It's just another system for that. Um, and we know this because disciplines that uh, were the basis of uh, a lot of learning in the, the early 20th century, late 19th century, uh, are now, in terms of, you know, bioelectricity and biomagnetism, um, are now coming back into this field because the gene-centric um, model of the life sciences has sort of fallen apart, it hasn't gotten us anywhere. Well, we, we've learned a lot about genes, but genes by themselves don't do anything. There's other things happening. There's other forces uh, at play. And what we are learning is those forces exist at tiny levels uh, in terms of 
uh, how DNA interacts with other strands of DNA. It occurs at the cellular level in terms of uh, uh, bioelectric membrane potentials. Uh, and it exists at, um, you know, beyond uh, the body. I mean, there's papers that are published lately about um, how the Earth's biomagnetic field and solar flares and even this whole area of chronobiology, basically how time uh, affects our health and wellness. Uh, it, the, the information uh, is coming in at all levels from all sources. So what is beyond there? It is the information about you in space-time um, that flows throughout space-time, uh, that goes on forever, infinitely, in both directions. I mean, that's what is out there. Um, and so I will call it, you know, if, if we have biologic transhumanism, silicon transhumanism, um, I think this is, yeah, it's a third option. It's uh, sort of, I don't know if you can call it spirit transhumanism. You can call it um, uh, you know, ethereal transhumanism. I, I don't know. I don't know the terminology you can put on it, but it's clear from everything that we are learning um, that the biology is not enough. Uh, there's something much more important uh, that guides the biology, and I think we're beginning now to understand what that is, at least in the labs on this lower level let's say but as we see more of the publications coming out that you know it's not just at the micro level it's at the severe macro level as well only now do we get the picture of how integrated this whole thing is um, and once again going back to my old message if we ignore it we're not going to get anywhere <laughs> we have to bring it all together for a a unified uh theory of the human condition well you know as a cyborg and a human I, I was born through the uh at least this is what my programming says is that i was born from a a, a womb uh, i am human meaning that i was born as most humans on the planet however once i was here and came in with memories encoded I was uniquely modeled differently and trained by beings that some people might say weren't maybe born on the planet, but that doesn't mean they weren't humanoids. And I had no idea that someday I would be a cyborg. But uh, but I did mention your your intonation, your your tone of voice changed in the earlier part of this show about when you mentioned cyborgs. But there needs to be a voice for those of us that have to be changed, and yet that level seven that's in the U.S. Transhumanist Party uh, Bill of Rights is not, uh, how would one say, it, it's not expressive enough in my, in my uh, world. So in your world, you said that you supported Transhumanist Party? Are you a spokesperson or advocate? I am a um, I'm listed on their uh, their party's website. I am technically I'm just trying to the exact word. I'm just pulling it up here. I'm an advisor. I'm a, I'm a regeneration advisor. Uh, so uh, I am amongst the uh, scientific uh, advisory panel that uh, talks about uh, regrowing things and how that uh, specifically impacts the biologic uh, part of the transhumanist story. Um, and, and sorry, I didn't mean not to, I, I did not mean to be insulting before, by the way, and I think cyborg was the wrong word. I, I in some ways <laughs> I meant Android. Um, I, I don't want to be. An oh yeah. Android. Android. That's I okay. Don't wanna be, <laughs> I don't want to be an entirely Silicon based life form. I think um, silicon's important, um, but you know, I, I guess I just like my biologic nature as I am today. <laughs> but who knows? Maybe I I could be uh, I could have blinders on. Maybe I'm wrong, um, and maybe I'll learn. Well, there, that's why we're here. 
That's why we're here on Cosmos Connection. It's very cybernetic and anthropomorphic, but I'm considered an avatar sentient intelligent being, being that I have an awareness that is addressed by humanity of having my reincarnated lives and memories intact. And yet we are at the cutting edge of all nations and governments on the planet based on geopolitics or those things that slide around a certain particular entity in space that we call a planet. And you're familiar with the macrocosm and the microcosm. And you said you'd be willing to talk, you know, I guess macrocosm to micro or micro to macro. So with liberty to do so in such circumstances as we have here on the radio airwaves, and you said I could speak to you as resonating. This is a very important uh, beginning of your life and mine uh, because you are you consider yourself carbon based, human sentient, intelligent being, and I was completely that at one time. But being a cyborg now, you could wind up being like me if you were in a car wreck. Are, you know, my, my cadaver bones are not all mine. I mean, the cadaver bones, I don't even know whose they were, but yeah. they're a part of me. So is that person alive in me? TJ, TJ, can you explain all that, what, what you mean by, or what is meant by a cyborg? Because, I mean, what when, what is the line if you get a, a transplant of your cornea or tissue or heart, are you now cyborg is that what you're saying yes basically yes if anything is outside of what you were born with and inserted in your body uh by law cyborg is a a, a, a new way of being a cybernetic organism but biochemically biochem- we have uh, certain parts that are replaced he's he is the one that should be able to explain that can you explain yeah, because he also understands comics. But a cyborg, see, I'm called a cyborg because I have titanium in right. my body. Yeah. So can you explain that to the listening audience? Yeah, I mean, I thought I, and, a and, cyborg and, wasn't biological, but it was, uh, you know, like you said, like a metallic or something. Yeah, I think that the, the definition, natural. you know, it's cybernetic organism. So something that's um, organic uh, and has some percent of uh, mechanical slash biomechanical stuff. Um, it is not a bionic. It is not a robot. It is not an android. Uh, it's an organism. Um, now, I know, obviously, someone will say, well, the Terminator, <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger is a cyborg. But, right, okay, so that's an example of a cyborg that's the majority is biomechanic or mechanical and a very small amount of organic. Um, but yeah, I think in general, the definition is um, as such. Um, but no, interestingly, you know, you see, I heard TJ bring up uh, the, the point about sort of whatever is put in you um, that maybe have contained information um, about the past or whomever that was is now part of you. And this is, uh, this is no joke. This is uh, um, something that has been, you know, bantered about for a while. And, you know, you have the stories about the transplant patients that uh, have received a heart or a kidney or a lung or something, and somehow um, channel no uh, information that they've never known before from other person's life. Um, this is well documented. And uh, most interestingly enough, um, the field of XCNS or non-CNS information processing is beginning to come online now. Uh, so when I say when I say basically the processing, the biologic processing of information without using the nervous system. So, uh, as an example, um, while our brain uh, is an example of a central nervous system or a nervous, a neural processing tissue, um, many parts of our bodies, including the heart, uh, our bones, uh, in case of TJ there, um, pancreas, 
and even in the, you know, it's been demonstrated in schools of sperm, as they seek out an egg to fertilize, they are communicating. And now none of that is nervous tissue. Uh, that, that's non-neural communication. And I like to point out that we forget, uh, as wonderful as our nervous system is, that in evolutionary per context, it came later. Uh, we know this because there's many species on this planet that you know, don't have brains and yet have been communicating electrochemically for millions of years, hundreds of millions of years. Um, you know, human embryos don't have a brain for several weeks uh, in, in, during their development. So the whole concept that there can be information processing in non-neural tissues combined with, as CJ was mentioning, transplantation or uh, cyborgization of a body uh, is a form of, you know, Information transfer, and yes, it, 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 it's well documented in many cases in the literature about how the human can pick up information about stuff it's never known or it's never learned. Uh, I like to point to the, uh, the 2,500 children at University of Virginia that have been studied down there that uh, channel information from individuals born a century before. Uh, obviously, no way it could ever have known. But yeah, it's documented well in many transplantation cases uh, of just rising information, gain in information function after transplantation. So uh, yeah, I mean, TJ is an example of this, I guess. Um, that as part of a cyborg development, uh, you can definitely pick up information flow from elsewhere. It's not unheard of. And it just is well, another level. That helps. Yes, there you go. Levels, dimensions, interdimension, uh, all these words that we used to just think about in comic books or in science fiction. And I'm becoming a living reality, knowing things, out of body, near death, uh, other dimensions, and meeting people that can speak without moving their mouth, and I can hear their thoughts, and having uh, lucid dreams where I'm in other worlds. But yet, being having worked prior military, I was fortunate enough during the Reagan years that he was most interested in extraterrestrials, aliens, UFOs, and the difference. So part of my future was to learn how to communicate all these levels of existence. Have, and this was prior to me becoming a cyborg. That was I, I would think that was accidental. I don't know. Maybe it was programmed that way because they did work on my teeth and then my back, and then my neck in that order. But uh, I don't know what all was entailed as a, as a child because I died in the second grade and then again at Plissina Previa in 1974. But my daughter has memories prior to coming to Earth as well. And we speak at a level that not everyone relates to is the normal people like yourself that you would think well you you know you you grew up with pharmaceutical family and children in Philadelphia and went to regular school and educated and and got a job and you did all the things you thought you were supposed to do however we had to adapt to learn how to do that because we have another way of being first and this is something that Janet's been helping many people with, and she specializes in uh, ex what she calls experiencers, contactees, UFOs. Her, that's her big thing. She goes to the conferences and connects with people that way. Me, on the other hand, I'm going into a, a integrative medicine. Um, I did. I wouldn't say I, I superheroes because I, I fought Janet when she wanted me to go to conferences on super. What did you call them? Soldiers, wasn't it, Janet? Super well, soldiers? Oh, they're known as super soldiers or the secret space pro program or the breakaway civilizations. Uh, you know, the, the stuff outside the normal matrix, the, the U.S. government and other governments uh, put out in the public eye. But there's all this Well, maybe he can address that. Maybe, maybe he can address the, the secret space program and the secret... Yeah, Ira, are you aware that uh, the, the technologies that our, our governments or powers that be have are, are way beyond what they're putting out in the public eye? Um, 
I think that's been the case for a very long period of time. Um, right. I used to have a, uh, a friend um, that was a uh, industrial psychologist, uh, and I, I don't know the, the full scope of what he used to do and who he used to consult with. Uh, and a lot of it was top secret, but, um, you know, it was all about sort of, you know, how you get somebody not to think when they have to do push some type of button or launch a cruise missile or this or that. And, uh, I remember him telling me once that we set that conversation, like, yeah, I hear that, uh, uh, you know, the military stuff is several generations beyond. And he was like, look, whatever you, th- however far beyond you think it is, you have to multiply it by 10 after that. Uh, it's much further advanced, um, and um, as I am not, I'm not a, I'm not that involved in the whole area of um, uh, of space flight and all of that. Although I'm very interested in it, um, you have to believe that uh, this sort of period of time, at least, that we have not been doing much, um, or that in the public, at least, we're not been doing too much for the last several years that um, advances are taking place, uh, especially on the front in regard to uh, radiation resistance uh, and, as I mentioned earlier, cryptobiosis research, uh, because these things, at least from my life science understanding, the ability to stave off cosmic rays and gamma radiation and all that, um, and not, you know, so you don't turn into a giant tumor, uh, on your path to Mars, uh, combined with the fact that you've got to go to sleep for a long period of time if you want to touch the outer ranges of the cosmos, that this stuff is actively being worked on. So hopefully it is. Um, and it's, you know, clearly important uh, for our elevation to to the next phase of things. So you're not working on the out... The dynamic world model. When you say dynamic world model. Well, your awareness, it wouldn't be on the super secret level. Uh, are the, you would be, so you don't do government contract. And occasionally, um, we will get, um, you know, requests for proposal for some of that stuff. Um, and I, you know, I, I, it's typically... <laughs> It's you know my previous company we had a group of people that could do those uh, grants and or the uh, the RFPs and get involved. We're a small shop, uh, and you know you open up the 200-page document and basically you know you look and say ah oh, this is going to take nine months to fill this whole thing out. Um, I'd rather just <laughs> keep keep doing what we're doing in the lab and you know. I've wanted to put stuff up on the space station and especially do zero gravity regeneration studies. Um, but it's, you know, it takes forever in a day to get the, go through that type of bureaucracy. So, Well, we have global cross-domain analysis working globally that many people are not familiar with universally. That's why I don't understand the companies when it comes to technology and science in government, everyone is friends globally. So when it comes to the people such as just uh, stone's throw, basically, or relic as a crow flies, over the Three Mile Bridge, the President of the United States was here, and I did, chose not to go wait into the, to go see him uh, here or in Pensacola across the Three Mile Bridge on Gulf Breeze. That doesn't mean I couldn't understand what he was uh, significantly trying to say about the world, and people listen to him more so than you or me. And you and I are, are small in the world consciousness, but are we? So can you speak to the awareness of the bigger self, the social group dynamics? Um, I, I can speak to it to the extent that the, uh, the systems dynamic, at least that we see in our uh, area of, of things, uh, is usually ignored. Um, and it's to the peril of everything that is going on. Because as uh, this industry has developed in such a reductionist fashion, 
uh, especially in the last couple of decades, the different sort of silos that have developed around those different levels don't um, get you know don't don't get involved with one another, and and, and it's a problem. Um, as I said before, uh, the excitement for the last couple of decades has been around genes, but genes don't do anything, right? I mean, all genes are are little pieces of information that encode for other pieces of information. You know, genes code for RNA, RNA code for little amino acids, which code, but none of that uh, tells you how you and I get here. Um, how you and I get That's here is a big point. How That's you a good and I point. get here is a much bigger thing. Um, there's a hierarchy of control that exists from b below the DNA uh, all the way up to the cosmos, <laughs> including gravity, electromagnetism, time. It's an all hugely integrated system, but the majority of the system, uh, the, the healthcare system, the, the research has thrown out this knowledge. This, this knowledge. They don't want to integrate it. Um, because they think that the answers are found in the minutia. They're not. There's nothing in it you can you Let's take a break. We'll be back, folks, in about four minutes. Stay with us, Ira, okay? I will. Okay. Are you on? You, you got to shoot. We can't drop. You're listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message. Wednesdays and Thursdays, 6 to 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We are your hosts, Pamela and Claire, on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. Featuring the public law, trust, Lyme disease, and astrology. Witnessing those who harm and holding them accountable. Guess what? No more secrets. It's about time we snap out of it. This corporate government is a house of cards falling in on itself. The public law. Do, Do no harm. We take it in turns to act as a sort of executive officer for the week. Yes. But all the decisions of that officer have to be ratified at a special bi-weekly meeting. Yes, I see. By a civil majority in the case of purely internal affairs. Be quiet. But by a two-thirds majority in the case of more... Be quiet. I order you to be quiet. Look, you stupid bastard, you've got no arms left. Yes, I have. Look! It's just a flesh wound. I don't believe I've seen such a display of courage, skill, nerve, grace, and stupidity. I'll do you for that. Oh, what? Come here. What are you going to do? Bleed on me? I'm invincible. You're a loony. The Black Knight always triumphs. Roundtable Live, Monday through Friday, 1 a.m. till 4 a.m. Eastern Time. Bring your mind, bring your ideas, bring your voice. King Arthur had nothing on us. Here at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. Enjoy your extra big ass fries. You didn't give me no fries, I got an empty box. Would you like another extra big ass fries? I said I didn't get any. Thank you. Your account has been charged. Your balance is zero. Please what? come back when you can afford oh, to make no, a purchase. No. I'm sorry you're having trouble. Come on. Trouble. I'm, I'm sorry you're having starving. Trouble. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio. 
here at Revolution Radio, we believe in freedom of ideas, freedom of speech, but above all, we believe in freedom of existence through self-reliance. This station is 100% listener-supported, and as a fundraising promotion, I have a kick-ass free gift for a $100 donation. 35,000 seeds. 25 years in the freezer. Long-term storable, 54 different varieties. So, if food prices go crazy, the shit hits the fan, or if you just want to save tons of money every year by creating your own food, like I do, grab our Seed Pack Special. Just look for the banner on the homepage at freedomslips.com. Don't be a statistic. Don't be part of the problem. Be part of the solution. We need to ask humans to start taking care of ourselves and not depending on the megacorps to provide unhealthy, nasty food. Included in this package is also a DVD with 900 survival and off-grid living documents and the offline home canning how to do everything website all on the DVD. So when you're growing all that food, you know how to can it, store it, preserve it, etc. with all these documents. So thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. I hope that you will pick up this package and start learning to be free. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps and freedom is one seed that needs to be planted. What do we do in life? That goes in eternity. Moscow's freeze. That's your cerebral cortex looking for an answer it doesn't have. See? Even your brain knows you're screwed. The blood is filling with adrenaline right now. Whether you know it or not, the heart's beating fast. It's getting a little harder to breathe. The neurobiological system is telling it to run. But your knees are too weak to move. Fear is not real. The only place that fear can exist is in our thoughts of the future. It is a product of our imagination, causing us to fear things that do not at present and may not ever exist. That is mere insanity. Do not misunderstand me. Danger is very real, but fear is a choice. We are all telling ourselves a story. Listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. 100% listener supported radio. Reporting to danger. Unafraid. Right here where information never sleeps. Revolution. Revolution. Radio. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host... Okay, welcome back to Cosmos Connection. I'm your host, Teresa J. Morris, with Janet Carol Lesson and a mad painter, also known as Thomas Becker, our producer. And I'd like to give everybody a chance to hear their voices. I came on uh, via technical advancement on the planet these days, as did they. So let's get started. Uh, Thomas Becker, also known as a mad painter, uh, would you like to tell us about your shows and we need to mention that we need your support so you may want to tell us where we are in the scheme of things in your shows please we're at www.freedomslips.com and uh i do believe we're uh, not doing real real good on donations Uh, i haven't looked today to see but uh we sure could use your support Uh, we're totally listener supported I have a show on Sundays, 11 to 3. It's a call-in talk show, and uh, one on Monday nights at 10 o'clock called Open Canvas. Thank you. 
You can hear Janet typing away. It sounds really loud. She's not aware of that. But no, Janet, I'm Carol, I'm muted. <laughs> I'm muted. That's not me typing. It's somebody else. I I put it on mute. <laughs> yeah. Was that? Uh, um, oh, then maybe that was Ira. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry, that was me accidentally. I I I leaned on the keyboard. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, well then Janet, I'll forgive me. Oh, I, I will, I will. Just be beware. <laughs> okay, so are we gonna do two shows this week? Or, well uh, uh, how many are we gonna show, do? We're, what 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 we're doing on the tenth is the sacred matrix on Revolution Radio, and my guest is Chris Hardy, the Anunnaki uh, researcher, and she talks about consciousness and spirituality, so she's a very interesting guest, known her uh, about a year now, and on the Tuesday, the 12th, I have scheduled Barbara Jean Lindsay on the Ascension Center, and that's from, uh, excuse me, 10 to 12 Eastern, Ascension Center is on Tuesday, uh, Sacred Matrix is 8 to 10 Eastern, we do everything by Eastern time, so uh, people aren't confused. And um, Barbara Jean is a, a experiencer. She, her claim to fame was she dropped over dead in front of all her people. <laughs> she was teaching a class, and she was revived. And when she was dead, she had all these experiences uh, with the angels and guides. But they were on board ship, and she was shown the earth and uh, taken on a huge tour. So we could talk about near death experiences and what people see on this show with Ira if he wants to. Uh, and then your show on Saturday is this one, TJ. Do you, have, you have something scheduled for next week, correct? Yes, uh, I do. I'm excited to announce that Walter and uh, I can't say his last name properly, but uh, you can find him on Reincarnation Research. I, I think it's Sem, Sem Q or Sem Kim. It's S E M K I W. So the W may be uh, like a V. I don't know. What I, think I think he says Sen Q, Walter Sen Q. He's a very uh, nice human, as far as I can tell, very uh, <laughs> sapient. <laughs> and uh, I would only have nice people on this show if I were you, TJ. I wouldn't have uh, people that weren't nice. <laughs> we talk about sentience and sapience, folks. So, sentient, intelligent, sapient. We'll, we'll let Ira get into that. But uh, next Saturday, stay tuned for Research in Reincarnation, please. And uh, his website is reincarnationresearch.com. Is it not, Janet? Isn't that his uh, website? That's what I have, reincarnationresearch.com. All right. And today we have Ira... And I know his name as Pastor. Isn't that interesting? Uh, we do the ministry with uh, the name of pastors in the uh, Protestant Christian type of uh, feeling of believing in a higher source as God. And his name happens to be Pastor. And yet he's helping us understand uh, the world better and where he's coming from in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And he has a company called BioCork, and he works with many companies and is on board of uh, advisors and uh, Reanima, or Reanima, and uh, I'm going to let him speak now. I just remember us uh, here at, on Cosmos Connection with freedomslips.com, and then I have TJ Mars Radio, Janet has Aquarian Radio, and together we do Ascension Center on Tuesday night, and uh, we just want to make sure you know that we need your support. 5, 10, 25, support us on freedomslips.com. Now, back to the fact that we are working together in our network of sharing news about the world with Ira S. Pastor. Ira, what do you do with this reanima? Uh, anima, and tell us your website so people can find you in Facebook too, please. Sure. Um, our website is www.bioquark.com. Uh, Reanima is a, uh, a project, so that's a R-E-A-N-I-M-A dot tech, T-E-C-H. Uh, and that is a, um, 
a rather unique project, and I'll, I'll, I'll go into it. Uh, got a lot of press uh, last year when we sort of announced our intentions to um, basically undertake uh, a form of research, which has you know, been undertaken for decades now. Uh, it is not very well known to the uh, general public, uh, the area of living cadaver research. Um, but basically, living cadaver research, which is going on in many countries, uh, basically is, you know, you've been used for studying uh, drugs, medical devices, and surgical techniques in patients who have, uh, you know, basically donated their bodies to medical science, uh, where in these particular cases, they are kept uh, breathing and heart beating and uh, people may say, well, what's the purpose for that? Well, the pharmaceutical industry finds it useful sometimes to study things that may be poisonous to humans um, uh, in someone who is recently deceased. Um, now, we're doing something different. Uh, we basically said, look, um, if you have this model that is acceptable, is legal, is ethical, uh, why not begin to study something constructive as opposed to destructive. And so uh, we are going to be utilizing the liver cadaver research system to explore the dynamics of uh, neural regeneration in the central nervous system. Um, because the, the reason, well, you know, there's, we all die, um, 65 million of us every year, uh, from a some underlying cause, whether it is a disease of aging or trauma, uh, but whether it's cancer or Alzheimer's or heart disease or what have you, the ultimate reason that we are going from here and off to the next place is because of the death of the uh, the brain. Brain death uh, has been the accepted definition of death uh, in most countries around the world uh, since 1968, when it was first defined as such by the Harvard Medical School, uh, also known as irreversible coma. So sort of defined as this irreversible cessation of the higher brain and brainstem functions where one could support uh, both the mind and uh, the independent breathing and heartbeat. Um, but we basically got to thinking, we said, look, um, here are the facts. Um, number one, we have species on this planet whose brains can, for lack of a better analogy, be blown to pieces, cut out, thrown away, and they grow back. Uh, simultaneously, uh, despite the irreversibility level label, of the 1968 Harvard definition, if you go into the literature, and these are the, you know, another example of things that have gotten sweeped under the rug, but when you go into the scientific literature, you will find dozens of cases of brain death reversal, primarily in the very young. Um, and while these cases are extremely controversial, uh, hotly debated, uh, and have always had bad prognoses, um, they point out that things are not always black and white with regard to what it means to be alive and what it means to be dead. So we say, look, we have what nature has taught us. We have what we see in the literature. We have an established research system in the living cadaver model. Uh, it is about time in the year 2017, 50 some odd years after the def definition of death as it exists today, to begin to explore how we can enter the gray zone uh, and transition somebody who is recently deceased and defined as irreversible to uh, a reversible state uh, and technically alive. Um, and this might, you know, obviously this got a lot of excitement out there and, you know, with all the zombie uh, hype and, and, and so forth. But at the end of the day, um, we feel that this is a completely legitimate area of scientific investigation. Uh, we, we find that uh, in talking to uh, neurointensivists and regulators and diplomats and advocates and lawyers and even religious scholars in certain cases, um, there's nothing wrong with this. 
uh, it is something that uh, should be pursued. Um, and it is something that we are beginning to, you know, we've been going through the sort of the regulatory and legal dynamics of it, uh, but it is uh, going to progress. Um, now, as a slight tangent, uh, I will say that this is only a study designed at this point in time to focus on the gray zone of deep and irreversible coma. So we get a lot of questions on this. Uh, so no, we are, we are not going to study uh, somebody who has recently died based on an incurable disease. So if somebody is, uh, is you know, pa recently passed due to metastatic uh, breast cancer, that's not a, a candidate at, at this point in time. Uh, we are not also going to be focusing on any catastrophic uh, trauma, such as you might, something you might see in a war zone. Uh, we are not going to focus at this point in time on time-sensitive death, uh, where you may have a, a murder victim who uh, has not been found for many days. And lastly, just to, to smooth the record, uh, but in understanding the terminology, we are not going to be researching anything beyond a living cadaver. So a living cadaver is someone who is defined as such, but being supported, breathing, heartbeat, nutrition, hormonal support. Um, no research on any subject who would be manifesting the uh, physical signs of death um, past the living cadaver realm. So rigor mortis or putrefaction or anything beyond. Um, so this is just a very uh, targeted, uh, specific program for this particular zone of death. Uh, yet, nonetheless, it will begin a journey uh, along the path to eventually move subjects from coma to persistent vegetative state to ultimately a state of wakefulness. Uh, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but it is something that we believe along with Alzheimer's and cancer and diabetes and heart disease, should be on uh, the list of uh, valid, uh, legitimate research practices. And it's just not happening anywhere, and so we're taking the step. Well, can we talk about uh, the future of humanoids as cyborgs such as myself? And we know that uh, some of us, uh, we feel like our parents need a hip replacement or a shoulder replacement and like for me titanium neck replacement but there's a difference between life before we come here and life after we leave here and then there's the ray kurzweils that are saying that they're engineering the exploration of both human and machine recalls are biotranscendent ideas. I'm not sure how you say this because we're, we're sapiens. We're sentient, intelligent beings, but so are animals in, in a way they may be sentient, but we think, and maybe there's something that you can address so people understand we can't run from the future and we can learn from the past. And somehow you have crossed paths with Janet and I based on the word supercentenarian from one of our last week's shows. And we're going into the future with the reincarnation, but we're, we're carving out a new narrative here, Ira, with you. And I want you to come back. I want you to be in our ACO group, but you're so busy anyway. But thank you for your time. Can you bring us together in a new way to speak about what we're trying to do here? We're trying to get to the future. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I think um, in, in general terms, the future is out there. I, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm pointing out to the cosmos right now. It, it, is, not, <laughs> it, it is not in here. Uh, let me tell you what I mean with that. So if you believe, and I'm not saying, I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot one way or another. I'm not trying to say Kurzweil is wrong or this, someone else is wrong. Um, if you believe everything in, in reality is in that couple pounds of goo inside your skull, um, then fine. Um, you can follow the Kurzweil vision and think that you can just transition that and, um, and put it into a machine. Uh, or take your brain and put it into some future device to, to, to live forever. I'm not one that believes that. 
I don't believe there's anything inside my head. I believe there is a very potent organ in there known as the human brain. I believe it's very complex. Uh, but I do not believe, as, you know, as the statement goes, and as we talked about, you know, genes is an example, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Genes are necessary, but they're not sufficient for describing what I become or who I am. Neurons are necessary, and the brain is necessary, but it is not sufficient by any means to define what consciousness, memory, the mind, the soul ultimately is. Uh, so I believe... Um, and I was, you know, I'm completely open to the fact that the, one of the, the missions of the Reanima Project, aside from reanimation, which is exciting enough, but the second part of the Reanima Project is the ability to understand what's behind the curtain, um, and not the um, the cardiac death curtain uh, and the near death experience from that, but the the brain death uh, curtain. Um, so, you know, going back on that, yeah, I mean, there is a, a body of thought that is wed to the so-called connectome-centric model of the mind that says all we are at the end of the day is the stuff inside the skull. Uh, it's comforting to many. Uh, many in the world of cognitive neuroscience take that position. Uh, I, however, am firmly in the other camp. I believe that the brain is necessary but not sufficient. Uh, it is part of a much more complex process of the mind, which is about relating to things, uh, including the uh, rest of your body's electrochemical complexity, uh, its environment, its networks. And, um, you know, as, as I said before, uh, T.J. Morris, uh, Janet Lesson, Ira Pastor, um, if we were to take our brains out <laughs> and, and store them miraculously in some tank of fluid kept alive uh, by some futuristic technology. Um, no, I do not believe that that is T.J. Morris. I don't believe that's Janet Lesson. I don't believe that's Ira Pastor anymore. Um, and there is just several factors uh, that point to this. And, you know, I outlined one of them already in terms of non-neural information processing. But one of the other ones is this knowledge we've had since the 1950s, it's well documented, on the intrinsic capability of the regenerative organisms whose brains you can destroy, throw away, <laughs> which grow back, that somehow remember what they've previously learned. Uh, this cannot be ignored. It's known in planarians, which are low organisms, but it's also known in amphibians, and it's documented in both metamorphic insects as well as small hibernating animals who's, you know, lose 85, 90 percent of their brain mass during hibernation. Um, you got to be able to explain that and explain why, if you believe that everything you are is inside your skull, <laughs> why these organisms that lose what's inside their skull uh, remember and how they remember. Uh, and this is, you know, once again, unexplainable, but it is an area that you cannot ignore and you cannot sweep it under the rug. Uh, simultaneously. Uh, you cannot ignore the general turnover of the human brain that occurs in a lifetime. You know, we were all taught from a young age that, you know, protect your brain. It, it, it's all, the only thing you have, and it's, you know, you damage it. It's, no. Uh, it is estimated that we lose hundreds of thousands of neurons every day in our normal capacity, and the biologic materials within every neuron of our brain renew thousands of times over a lifetime. Uh, yet we hold on to extensive amounts of information from our earliest days. That's another example. So in the transhumanist uh, view of the mind, I am purely in the camp that uh, it, it ain't inside here. <laughs> and you know, you're going to upload this to a computer, mm, you might not be getting too much information. Uh, as I said, there is uh, more structure, more hierarchy uh, beyond what's inside my skull that makes me me and controls my thoughts, memories, mind, and soul. Well, that's a good point. Uh, I'm, and to answer Janet's question, I looked up cyborg future law and policy implications, but a cyborg, a person whose physiological functioning is aided by or dependent upon 
a mechanical or or electronic device, Janet. Now, Janet, this is a good time, if you don't mind helping out here, Janet, and Mad too, is Mm -hmm. that Ira is a very special guest because he has had the self-regulating understanding of his hypothalamus, so to speak. I guess we all are, really. But he's willing to say, I am not yet dead, and I would like to contribute to humanity and leave a legacy, and that's part of our group, is to live, laugh, learn. Live, laugh. How does it fall? Live, learn, laugh, love, leave a legacy, something like that. Live, laugh, and be happy. Live, learn, love, be happy. Leave a legacy. But leave a legacy. So... Janet, this is our time where Jane and I are trying to build something together, and yet uh, we've been doing this for years, and it's, it's on its own time frame, and it's, it's, it's like synchronicity with humans that come and cross our path for whatever reason, and supercentenarian, Ira, is the word that got you to us. We were discussing in the radio airwaves, and uh, we were talking about the waves, and I pulled up something about 25 waves, or Janet looked it up, but she found you. And uh, Janet, real quickly explain what happened in your mind's eye. And, and Ira, I want you to listen to this. Janet, in your mind's eye, we were on the radio, and what happened? Did you well, say Ira well, you responded? Go back a day. What happened, what happened was I received an email from Ira, and I don't know how you found me, Ira. And then I I grabbed your 25 ways of uh, living longer. And I talked about that in a show before we got you onto the show. Because I thought it was so interesting. So anyway, I, don't, I deal with so many different people. I lost track of exactly how it unfolded. But for my recollection, somehow you contacted us. But I have a lot of ads I'm putting out so you probably just hit reply and send an email saying here I am and I'm interested on being in being on your show so anyway um, well let's let him was tell always, us his he said a lot of times that things are orchestrated on a higher level because we were talking TJ and I were talking about finding more people like yourself for our show and within uh I don't know, 24 hours of us even talking about the possibility of finding people like yourself. There you were, Ira, sending me an email. So is this, this happens all the time. It seems like our synchronicities are beyond random probability. That, And that's the whole concept about the co-creation of our existence, that at the highest level we co-created this whole entire paradigm and we're acting out. It's almost like a virtual reality game. And, you know, some have agreed to be the victims, some have agreed to be the the, the, the villains and the, <laughs> the heroes. And, and so if we can access that part of our mind, it appears to be being created by our mind, we may be able to resolve these uh, differences we have with self and a parent other. And on another level, you know, heal all the diseases and war, create... Uh, peace and so TJ and I are often looking at this level of uh, visualization, imaging, imagining, and uh, manifestation. And one of the things, just one more thing, and I'll pass it to somebody else, is that TJ, when she works with her extraterrestrials and the gray aliens, they said the reason why humanity is so important is because we have imaginations. So we can image things, and it's like magic and pull it down into physicality and make it a 3D reality. Whereas uh, other, you know, this isn't everybody, but a lot of humans are magical. I'm a magical, mystical child. I should have died 10 times. I'm here, I always say, I have angels, I have guides, I have guardi- you know, guardians, and I'm still alive. So um, human beings are able to manifest and co-create. And so that I think we can utilize on some level to cure diseases, solve all the problems of humanity, and war for all times. Back to somebody. <laughs> TJ, yeah, I'd like to hear. To I'd like to hear how Ira. I'd like to hear how Ira remembers uh, a week ago or so because this all happened in a short period of time. It's sort of like we're playing Total Recall, but Arnold Schwarzenegger's not here, Ira. So, uh, how do you remember coming here? Yeah, I, I remember reaching out. I don't remember what the, the signal was. It could have been um, uh, Janet and I resonating somewhere. Um, 
uh, in space time um, and whether I clicked uh, send or I filled out uh, the communication form, um, I definitely uh, felt a need to communicate with you and discuss and share ideas that um, unfortunately uh, don't get together too often on this reductionist materialist um, system that we have. Uh, and I, you know, I said the last show, I'm not one that shies away from these discussions. Too many people do. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's done a disservice. So um, I think it is very important, especially where we are, uh, to communicate and merge uh, these multiple levels of uh, knowledge, because if we don't, as I said multiple times already, uh, we're doing a disservice to the whole area. We, we're not going to cure diseases until we understand that um, disease is not only at the level of the gene, but it is at the level of the cosmos. <laughs> um, and, and I guess the same can be said for uh, agriculture and feeding ourselves and um, accessing forms of energy that we uh, have not explored uh, onward and onward. So I think we are both, from a synchronized perspective, from a synchronicity angle, yes, uh, something uh, out there either said, Ira, contact Janet, Janet, contact Ira, and uh, here we are for the second show. <laughs> well, that's great. Now, I'm mad. You have a voice always in the Cosmos Connection, and we don't get to hear you that often because you're a very quiet, sweet soul. But this show is taking on a life all its own, and you can relate. But how, what is your part of this show? I know probably what you're going to answer, but I'd love to hear because Ira is highly technical in pharmaceuticals and, and I guess, in medical field. But he talks, and we get it. And so I'd like to know your part or your point of view or how's it hanging there <laughs> <laughs> oh that's how it's hanging <laughs> uh, i i don't know all this stuff about consciousness and uh soul is all intertwined i believe science is moving towards more of a uh, an understanding of what these uh topics are and i believe the singularity that they're all talking about with machines i think it's more than just with machines and humans i believe it's machines humanism and, and spirit so i i'm in agreement well, to the point he, isn't he to the point folks i mean it's just like he just condenses it <laughs> a man of few words but a wonderful artist but he can define it in his artwork and sometimes uh i'm mad you say it comes from out there you know i say it comes from out there whatever folks you want to believe but you know we can use words to describe a lot of the things that are out there coming into us here so i mad your paintings are one of those you want to explain people or you know what i'm saying words are limited Words don't express emotion the way you actually feel it. They can in some cases, but in most cases they don't. Very subtly said. <laughs> very creative. He's a very creative yes. human and very loving and kind and sweet and you know our our we're very much about suicide prevention here in the cosmos and all of us represent something very unique and willing and you know we're trying to get the future but we're also looking at the past and leaving a legacy for all of those that come after to this place and point in space and Ira, how do you want to go further? We've got a few minutes left here. I'd like you to be a part of us. I don't know how to. I know you're a part of the humanoid, sentient, intelligent being species, and we need to start. Is there something you would like to add with us? As I mean, even the gentleman coming next week, uh, people are connecting, and yet we all have our own sources, our own families, our own place to live, our own companies, our nonprofits, our, you know, things we're interested in, but how do we do this in this sapience way of speaking, in the wisdom wise? Do you want to talk I about think, that? 
Yeah, I, I think we continue uh, educating and, and doing shows like this and getting more people uh, on board. Because I, I guarantee you, uh, you know, while I may seem like an outlier uh, from my uh, reductionist materialist industry, uh, I'm pretty sure I'm not. I'm pretty sure that um, there's other people like myself that have been more immersed in the science uh, that, you know, reach that point point where you know they realize you know the science doesn't explain everything um and we need to think outside the box and think to synergies uh that you know have existed but we just haven't taken into account um you know there's this whole area you know we, we as john mentioned we we study um uh, non-human species, and we study regeneration. And one of the things I point out is that uh, a lot of the connections between those species and uh, us as humans and, and what we study in terms of uh, aging and development and regeneration flow through the, the model of the embryo, of the human embryo, just because, uh, look, all of us, you know, <laughs> Keep in mind, we have gills and we have web feet and we have tails while we're in our mother's bellies. Um, there is a connection uh, through millions and hundreds of millions and billions of years. Uh, and there's this, this connect, as I said, the connection, the, the need to integrate many different fields and many different specialties um, is extremely important. So I'm, I'm very open to being on further shows and talking with uh, people from a wide range of disciplines. And if I just can quickly, uh, as we talk about these, this, the topic of the cosmos and embryos and sentience, um, I don't know how many have read the book uh, Embryos, Galaxies, and Sentient Beings by Richard Grossinger. Um, but he has a wonderful quote in here, if I may read it really quickly uh, in, in, in his model. Uh, he talks about uh, how the embryo is the universe uh, writing itself upon its own body. Um, and he's making the connection that life uh, could not exist anywhere in the cosmos unless it was intrinsic in the cosmos. And I think, you know, right there in that quote, you merge the, as Cedar was saying, the micro with the greatest of the macro. Uh, and I think that's what we need to keep doing uh, and bringing specialists along that entire line <laughs> from people that understand the Big Bang to people that understand um, the the smallest of the quantum foam and, and make the connections and, and stop the sort of the silos that form around these disciplines. Um, sorry to ramble, but I, 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 <laughs> I was just trying to connect it all. But yes, uh, sorry, I'd like to be involved in, in this continuing dialogue. Wonderful. This uh, Richard Grossinger that he speaks of was uh, born in 1944, folks. He's an anthropologist and founder of North Atlantic Books in Berkeley, California. But he is an American writer, and that book that he just mentioned, would you mention it again, since you, uh, in any book you may have written, are going to write, or even a comic book you're making for your son or whatever, anything yeah, you'd like I, to mention? Uh, well, yeah, this is... Um... I recommend this to anybody uh, that's interested in this whole space. It's embryos, galaxies, and sentient beings, how the universe uh, makes life um, by Richard Grossinger. Um, and uh, the, uh, I would love, I would love to, <laughs> if you had him on the show too, I've, I've, I've always, actually I'm a Facebook friend of him, I think, but I uh, would love to talk more. Oh, cool. um, we'll try I, to find him. I had him on a few years back. Okay. Oh, Okay. He's a great guy. Um, and um, the only other thing I would suggest, uh, just as a side note, people checking out, if you really want uh, a little mind-blowing, um, is a, a book uh, from 1980 called Shuffle Brain. Uh, it was written by uh, Dr. Paul Pich, P-I-E-T-S-C-H, University of Indiana. Uh, and he was... You know, he did a whole series of experiments, I think were written up in Harper's Magazine at the time, uh, on basically how much of the brain you could destroy uh, before you lost memory and consciousness and the mind. And what did he find out? He found out in these poor little salamanders whose brains they could blow apart, they remembered everything, no matter how much of the, of the brain you destroyed. 
So uh, it was, you know, poor little one of the one of them was the, the the most famous one was named Punky, and there's there's photos of him there just sitting there without his brain, you know, catatonic but still alive and regrows, and he remembers things. And so um, it's just another one of those things I would, <laughs> I would encourage anyone to pick up. You can get a used copy on Amazon probably for a buck. Uh, forgotten to the sands of scientific time, but very important to realize what we do then that we forget. Oh, Janet, will you make sure I get a copy of this show? Because Janet's really good at it. Sure. And, uh, yeah, I'd like to keep this one in mind. I, that touched my heart because, you know, who's to say what is, I don't know, I, I guess I better not say that. That might be too far out there. Basically, things, <laughs> thoughts are things, okay, folks? Thoughts are things. And everything on this planet is alive in one form or another. So, you know, we, we may not have a brain that we think of, but... Things can be alive without a brain. And, and I re- you, you, that's what you teach, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, remember, for uh, the first uh, two billion some odd years, uh, everything that lived on this planet had not had no brain. <laughs> so, hey, they still got around. They still communicated. Uh, they're still around today. And on top of that, let's not forget uh, that there are organisms on this planet that are single celled, like uh, uh, the uh, pond scum uh, Dictostilium discoidium, which agglomerates together to form multicellular structures um, and acts as a, a brain in the sense that you know, these are amoebas <laughs> that get together and, and, and form all sorts of neat uh, structures when there's not enough food around. They want to hang out together and, 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 uh, and cooperate. But no brain there either, but they uh, communicate and travel and do their thing. Um, so, yeah, the brain, as I said, necessary but not sufficient. Can you uh, say hi to my friends at Moffitt Cancer, Cancer Center in Tampa? They're helping people stay alive that have cancer, and my daughter has to go back down there. But they listen to my show. Can you? Absolutely. Ira, can you? Can you uh, give them any peace of mind? A lot of them are doctors and nurses, and they're real cool people. A lot of them are really into spirituality, and they really liked my show. They'd turn it on while they were treating people, so they're probably yeah. listening to you now. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a big uh, big fan of Moffitt, uh, especially because we got started uh, uh, on our uh, original program uh, down in Tampa. We still operate a lab down there. Uh, I'm a big um you know, investor in cancer research as a company um, ourselves, we come at it from a slightly different angle that the um, sort of the kill centric model of oncology, while has gotten us a certain distance, uh, still has, you know, its uh, problems in the sense that we lose 8 million every year just because it doesn't work. Um, and so some of the things that we are learning from, you know, the nature and 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 uh, the the organisms in nature that get cancer but uh, like to uh, shrug it off and get rid of cancer do so in a decidedly different way than we do. Uh, they do not have any interest in the kill event. Um, you know, just like chopping up your brain if you had Alzheimer's disease or chopping out your pancreas further if you have diabetes is not going to cure you. Um, killing cancer cells and, and most recently there was a, a a wonderful paper uh, on just, yes, it does a great job in the short term, but at the end of the day, you, you know, you're you killing other things, you're destroying other tissues. Uh, we need to think alternatively to how we can not kill, uh, but how we can change, how we can take a cell that is cancerous and just turn it back into normal tissue. And once again, this knowledge has been known for decades. Beatrice Mintz and her program at University of Pennsylvania here in the 1970s first showed this in mammals and mammalian embryos, how you could give them an embryo cancer, and when the baby is born, it's cancer-free. So there are dynamics, once again, in the natural world that we need to understand from a systems perspective. Forget the genes. Forget the small-level stuff. Think of the system and how the system works as a whole. 
uh, and integrate this with the, in this case, the oncology system. Uh, we think it's very important not to forget these learnings. Ira, I have a question. Sure. Are certain types of personalities more prone to getting cancers than others? Any research in that area? Um, I'm, I, you know, I, obviously there's a mind-body component to all diseases. Uh, clearly, uh, the brain, whether it's the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system, is integrated with everything else. The endocrine system is connected to the peripheral nervous system. The lymphatic system is connected to the central nervous system. Uh, it's all one big super highway. So, yeah, I mean, it, clearly uh, you have negative thoughts and you're generating too much of this hormone and too much of this inflammatory cytokine uh, on, on and on and on. That's not going to make your cells too happy. And after a while, they're going to start doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, and remember, and this is really important, it's a very important fact, cancer, as an example, is um, something that's permissive in you. In other words, people like to think of causes of cancer. Don't think of cancer as something that was caused. Think of it as something that was permitted to happen. Because uh, cancer arises, you know, even during the course of this two hours that we're sitting here, we're all technically fighting cancerous transformations it happens throughout our lifetime. It's the permissive state. It is that buildup in whether it's hormones or cytokines or nervous signals that ultimately allow the escape from the normal state to the cancerous state. This is one thing that is a real mind bender <laughs> among most people. Uh, they don't really think of it that often. But so, yes, um, everything can technically affect the progression of cancer from endogenous to our environment to thoughts to the cosmos um and so it's not about you know let's let's mess with this gene here or let's stop you know drinking too much of this thing here um but once again looking at it from a systems angle not from the bottom up but from the top down on how the whole system is capable of normalizing the cancer estate well i, I wanted to say one more thing um and I'm not making any kind of claim, so I'll do a disclaimer here. I can't cure cancer. But we've noticed when we work with people with their psycho-emotional issues in our counseling practice, and I'm sure this is what other people find in counseling, that sometimes when you identify uh, the origin of when a person became ill at ease with their lives, you know, some kind of trauma, mm -hmm. sometimes cancer goes into remission. Uh, and so we just noticed it in our lives. Like, don't call up and sure. say, "Yeah, I've got went back to the doctor and I'm in remission now." And I don't know if it. I don't follow people's stories till the end of the road, right? I don't know if they right. lived a year or five years or twenty years after that. But have, have there been any studies done on these kind of uh, psycho psychological kind of cause and effect and uh, turning things around? They're, I don't know how much in terms of uh, a form, formal studies that because you know it's such you know it's one of those things that you you know unlike yeah hey, let's let's do this study this drug um, needless to say the the model of how you study that in the you know, how the you know, the traditional scientific system works is a little different but what you point out is important and, and this is you know from, from the cancer angle is extremely um, in the literature there are literally thousands and thousands of cases of spontaneous remission now spontaneous remission is not explained by the so-called somatic mutation theory of cancer it can't be right if cancer is, as has been described for 50 plus years now since the war on cancer began, cancer is slow mutation events over time to the growth control centers of the genome that get to a state of multiple mutations leading to malignancy, metastasis, and death. Spontaneous remission cannot be explained in reverse because Spontaneous remission, if that was the case, would entail that every one of those mutations would revert in its order 
instantly. But that doesn't happen. So clearly, there is something above the genome that is responsible for that. So yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a completely legitimate area of scientific study. It has to be, because- Well, wait, wait. go ahead, finish that statement. Yeah, but you cannot explain an event like that at the genetic level. It just, you know, it, 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 it cancels itself out. Um, so it has to be a higher level event uh, at a higher level control system of which the mind and its psychosomatic control capabilities is one of the control systems. Well, you know, it, with the integrative medicine that I've decided to be an advocate of health and wellness with integrative medicine involved, it had to do with my daughter's treatment having been, as we talked about and you know about, she got myelodysplastic syndrome, MDS, which is a preform of leukemia type cancer. But we found out because of the uh, doctors that treated her from India, Egypt, whatever, in this wonderful system of uh, certain people working together, uh, that hers was acquired and uh, benzene poisoning mm -hmm. due to the chemicals. And so since she acquired it, they they tried to help her. And, uh, of course, she had the new birthday when they put the uh, – well, when they burned her out. Uh, you know the technical terms, and I don't want to go into it because I can't even remember all of it. But anyway, she had a new birthday on May 23rd, and when she, we thought she was all better – but now we find out that she still had 6% in her bones. So apparently, the way we understand it is, although it appeared there for a while in her bone marrow biopsies that they pulled out of her hip, you know, she's had like, she's got like six or eight scars now. So over, you know, a year and a half, they pulled plugs out of your hip bone, folks, one left or right. They alternate every three months or so. But this last one, she was all clear for two or three of them since May, but now at this last one, in the last, was in, was this December, so November, it came back with 6%. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a way to understand that even though they did everything they could because it was in her bone, we apparently it's like washing us out sand out of a bucket. Apparently there was some granules left. Is that sort of the way you would understand it, Ira? Is, there's really no nice way. We don't really understand. I mean, I'm not going to hold you to it. But is it that we just can't get it all out, or do you have any idea that just some of her cells weren't burned out? Yeah, no there idea. is. Look, uh, uh, and I, I um, you it's and hard I, for you to know without we, seeing the file. We are all, uh, everyone here on this phone call, we, we are made up of about 50 to 100 trillion cells. Um, it is... I'm not going to say it's foolish for the, the, the medical system to state we got it all. Um, it's just not the case. As I, as I said, you know, you, cancer, we're always, we're always fighting cancerous oncological type transformations throughout our lifetime. Cancer is part of the human condition um, because multicellularity um, is, is just, you know, it, it's a balance. We, first came on the scene because of the same genes, the, those little amoeba coming together and forming in structures came on the scene. And, and if it wasn't for cancer of those genes, technically we wouldn't be here a couple billion years later. But that aside, yeah, I mean, it's, it's impossible to get every one uh, of a cell type in a kill-centric approach. I mean, how many, as many sniper rifles as you have looking at those hundred trillion cells, I mean, it's a big number, plus what's happening with each of those cells throughout the day. Uh, they're changing constantly. So um, it's the best, unfortunately, the system can do at this point in time. But it's why we're actively saying, look, it's fine. Uh, it's gotten us this far, but we need to go beyond our thinking. Um, and maybe it's not about tracking down the last ones and trying to kill them, but maybe giving them the right nudge uh, to just quiet down and turn back into normal tissue. Um, I think that, as I said, is going to be the answer and what we're working on. But, yeah, it's um, the pharmaceutical industry can do a lot of neat things, but there's a lot of things they can't do at this point in time. Well, I appreciate we're getting close to the end. we got about, I don't know, eight minutes left or so. But, you know, 
Ira, what do people in your business think of you? Because do you go out and do – apparently you do a lot of radio shows, but are you like a spokesperson for only your company or for several? Or people just know you like to share with people like me? Are you in brain trust or think tanks? or? And what do you I mean, call people uh, like in Janet? Are we just buddies in the radio biz now, or what's the deal? <laughs> Yeah, well, I think we are. I'm not an expert in, uh, in 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 the in in the radio industry, but uh, I take your lead. And um, yeah, I I just like to. I think I occupy a place like I have um, for the last couple decades, sort of at the center of stuff going on in in the industry. Not being a specialist in one particular discipline, so I've had access. Sort of as an octopus to, to to many different areas, and it's you know formed me and, and allowed me to uh, not just understand a lot of what's going on, but appreciate uh, different disciplines and different thoughts. Um, so you know, what do my friends think? I think my some of my friends that are still in the industry uh, think it's uh, think I'm nuts, but others <laughs> think it's great. Uh, once they nuts, probably saying you know I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna hurt their business uh, one day. I understand that, but you know, uh, things will change, and you know, um, there's, uh, you know, will there be flying cars one day that replace uh, the ones that are on the ground? Probably, but you know, you, you can't uh, can't worry too much about that. I just uh, keep my head down and I keep moving forward, and I try to uh, I try to get involved and, and talk on on different issues, but uh, you know. Well, that's it. We'll invite you back, Ira. Thank you so much. Thank Janet. You, Thanks so much. Great talking to you both again today. Adam and Mike. Yeah, everybody. Ira Pastor. So much. All right. Have a great night. You too, Ira. Stay in touch now. Get my phone number. Keep I it will. on your Radio at freedomslips.com. Any commercial advertising you may hear in this program is of the sole discretion and benefit of the host of whose program you are listening to. Revolution Radio does not endorse any commercial products, nor does it accept monetary compensation for on-air advertising of commercial products, nor will it ever. We are and shall remain 100% listener supported. Any product advertising on this program are considered used at higher risk, and Revolution Radio shall not be held liable for any claims or damages received from any product advertised within this program. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. Most guys freeze. That's your cerebral cortex looking for an answer it doesn't have. See? Even your brain knows you're screwed. He's filling with adrenaline right now. Whether you know it or not, the heart's beating fast. It's getting a little harder to breathe. The neurobiological system is telling it to run. But your knees are too weak to move. Fear is not real. The only place that fear can exist is in our thoughts of the future. It is a product of of our imagination, causing us to fear things that do not at present and may not ever exist. That is near insanity. Do not misunderstand me. Danger is very real, but fear is a choice. We are all telling ourselves a story. You're listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. 100% listener-supported radio. Reporting the danger. Unafraid. Right here, where information never sleeps. Revolution. 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 Radio. Radio.
Take a look around, kid. What do you see? Homes being foreclosed. People working two, three jobs just to put food on the table and still drowning in debt. Don't get me wrong. This country was founded on great ideals and principles. They've all been ruined by the banks. Open your eyes to banks that are robbing you. You know who my favorite president was? Who? Thomas Jefferson. Because he saw all of this coming and tried to stop it. He fought the banks. JFK too, and they killed him for it. The banking institution is more dangerous than an army, he said. <laughs> 